This morning we are continuing in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Last Sunday we began a new verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter series in the book of Daniel. And we looked at chapter 1 and we saw that the people of God have been taken into exile as slaves to Babylon. Now Daniel was taken in the first of three captivities that Nebuchadnezzar brought upon the people of Israel of Judah, what's left of the nation of Israel. And Daniel was taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. He was taken from Jerusalem to Babylon in the year 605 B.C. And Daniel was young. He is described as as but a young man or a boy. He's probably 13 to 16 years of age um, when he is taken in 605 B.C. to Babylon. And he has three young friends as well, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Or you may know them better by um, by their Babylonian names in Aramaic which are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they have been taken out of their home in Jerusalem and brought a thousand miles away to Babylon to serve the king of Babylon. Now, there would be another captivity that would happen a few years later where um, Nebuchadnezzar would go back and get more people from Jerusalem Uh, and take them into exile. And then finally in the year 586, he would just destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple of Solomon and take all the people as slaves back to Babylon. So Daniel is in the first round of three captivities which will lead up to the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem which has not yet happened at this point in the story but it is coming in just a few years in the future. And in the meantime, Daniel is serving in the court of the king who is destroying his nation. So imagine, as it were, that it's the Cold War in America and Russia during the Cold War has come and taken you as a captive back to Moscow to serve their ruler. And you have to serve at the Kremlin, at the king or whatever, at the president's um, behest, and you have to help and serve him as a slave. That is the situation. These are the enemies of God's people, and Daniel has been forced to become their king's servant for the rest of his life. Why? Because God is going to reveal powerful truths through the prophet Daniel that this wicked king, Nebuchadnezzar, needs to hear. We saw in chapter 1 that God provided for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, these young faithful Jewish men who are serving in the king's court, by even though they were living on a diet of simply water and vegetables, or more literally seed-bearing food, so fruits and vegetables, and maybe some bread and grain. They had been living on a a very basic diet. They had become stronger, and it literally says fatter, than all the people who ate the rich food in the king's court, which is to say that we've already seen the indication of the Spirit of God at work in a small yet miraculous way. That on a diet of, of, of basic rations, Daniel and his three friends who have been faithful to God, God is providing for them in every way, even in their physical nourishment. And so now in chapter 2, we come to this famous vision of this great statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees in a dream. And I want you to hear me carefully this morning. This vision is going to be explained for the rest of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapters 3 through 12 are really going to explain what we see here in Daniel chapter 2 and elaborate upon it. So this functions really as kind of the thesis statement for the whole book. Chapter 1 introduces us to the court in Babylon and what's going on. Chapter 2 
is where we hear the main message of the book of Daniel, and then everything that follows is further explaining what we see here in chapter 2. So this is the most important vision in the book, and every other vision and every other prophecy that follows is further explaining what we see here. Now we have 49 verses to look at this morning, so we're just going to fly over that this morning. And as we do that, I am not going to be able to explain in the time we have this morning what it all means. But the good news is, is that the subsequent chapters of the book of Daniel are going to explain it. So in the next few months, we're going to further see what all of this means. And this morning, we're merely going to introduce it. So Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 1... The Word of God says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep, his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. Now as we look at the first two verses here, I want you to understand what's happening. First, chapter 1 began in the first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's father has died, and now Nebuchadnezzar becomes king of Babylon. And we're only one year in. Now we saw in chapter 1 that Daniel and his friends are being put through a three-year training course to serve in the temples, uh, in the court of the king of Babylon as wise men and advisors to the king who are supposed to be able to find out what the gods, as it were, in Babylon, as they believed in many pagan gods, what the, what the gods wanted the king to do because they believed that their success as a, a nation and a kingdom depended on pleasing the gods and it would be the job of these wise men and soothsayers in the king's court to find out what the gods wanted the king to do and they would find that and report it to the king and Daniel and his three friends are being trained to do that. And they're going to be trained for three years and one year into that three-year process, the king has a dream in the night and he needs answers to that dream. So, so Daniel and his friends have not yet even graduated their training course. They're a third of the way through, but crisis happens when the king is given a dream in the night. And let us be clear, God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream. And so God has brought about this point and moment of crisis. And it says in verse 2 that the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans would be summoned to the king to, to tell him his dreams. And this is their job. This is why they exist. So that when the king needs to know something from the gods, as he believed in, that these men would tell him what he should do by consulting with the gods. Verse 3, And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Now, if you're reading in the King James Version, it's going to say that the the, 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 the dream has left me. And, and I, the way that this Hebrew word is translated uh, is either um, that he's troubled or that the dream has left him. Looking at the context and what's happening, uh, because we're not sure, this is a, a Hebrew word that doesn't occur very often, we're not sure how to translate it, but it seems to best fit the passage, I think, to translate it that the king is troubled. He's, he has anxiety. He doesn't know what the dream means and he's worried because the dream, as we'll see in a moment, has a statue that kind of looks like him and the statue is destroyed. And so Nebuchadnezzar is saying, are, are the gods revealing to me that I'm going to be killed or what's going on? And so Nebuchadnezzar's worried and I think that's the way it should be translated. So this is important because I don't think that the king doesn't know what the dream is. I think he remembers what he dreamt Sometimes you have a dream and you can barely remember it. I think he remembers the dream. However, he's worried about what it means. 
So, in verse 4, Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, and now in the second half of verse 4, Daniel is writing the book in Hebrew, and he changes language to Aramaic with the words, O king, live forever. And now from the second half of chapter 2, verse 4, through the end of chapter 7, Daniel writes in Aramaic. He changes languages in the middle of the book. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, he'll go back to writing in Hebrew to the end of the book at the end of chapter 12. So why is this significant? Why did Daniel change languages? Moving from Hebrew to Aramaic would be like moving from Italian to French, uh, English to Spanish. These, these languages have similar words, but they're different languages. And just because you can speak one, you can't speak the other. And Daniel, for the past year, has been taught the Aramaic language as he's been in the king's court. Because we saw in chapter 1, the first things they did was they started teaching him Aramaic. Why does Daniel begin writing in Aramaic? Why didn't he just continue to write in Hebrew? Well, remember, they're trying to Babylonianize... Daniel and his three friends, they changed their names from Hebrew names, which bore testimony to the God Yahweh, the God of Israel, to Babylonian names, which bore testimony to the pagan gods of Babylon. And so, Daniel, by changing from Hebrew to Aramaic, is showing us that he's been ensconced in this culture. He, is, he has been totally submerged and... and, and, and Everything is foreign to him. Even to the fact that he begins writing in Aramaic to show us that this is a strange world to him and his friends. I mean, if you were taken to a foreign nation and, and, and you had to learn another language and you didn't get to hear the language that you grew up with anymore and you're being held there as a prisoner and a slave to serve their king, imagine what that must have been like. And I think Daniel's trying to communicate that even through changing the language that he's writing in. So, the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, and the language changed, O king, live forever. Now I just want to start in my say, Nebuchadnezzar is not going to live forever. He's a man just like you and I. And so they're, they're starting poorly because they're already promising Nebuchadnezzar immortality. And he ain't God. And he's going to die just like you and I. Tell your servants the dream. And we will show you the interpretation. The, the wise men of the king's court say, well, king, tell us what you dreamt. We'll tell you what it means. But Nebuchadnezzar's smarter than that. Verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. Nebuchadnezzar says, now I'm not telling you the dream. You tell me what I dreamed, and then you tell me what it means. And once again, I don't think it's because the king forgot what he dreamt. Because when Daniel later tells him what he dreamt, the king says, yeah, that's it, that's what I dreamed. I think the king knows, but he doesn't want to tell them the dream and then them just make something up so he doesn't kill them. Because you'd do the same, right? You'd say, oh yeah, this is what it means. You'd say anything to keep them from tearing you limb from limb. Literally meaning, I'm going to pull your arms and legs off. That's what they did. They would tie someone up and pull with horses in each direction and they would rip their arms and legs off, which of course would result in a very painful death. And Nebuchadnezzar says, that's what I'm going to do to you if you don't tell me what I dreamed and what it means. And then I'm going to tear your houses down for good measure. Verse 6, But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and its interpretation. You don't do it, I'm going to kill you painfully. You do it, hey, I'm going to make you rich. So tell me my dream and tell me what it means. Verse 7, they answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. If you just tell us, 
what you dreamt will tell you what it means. Verse 8, the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time. I know what you're doing. You don't know what I dreamt. And if the gods are really speaking to you, then the gods who gave me this dream would tell you what dream they gave me. And so if you really are hearing from the gods, then you can tell me what I dreamt, and that's how I'll know that what you tell me is the interpretation, the meaning of the dream, that it's actually real. Because if you can figure out what I dreamt, then I can trust the interpretation that you give. And so the king said, I know with certainty that you're trying to gain time because you know that the word for me is firm. Verse 9, if you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. i got to tell you, that's a tall order especially when these wise men and enchanters serve false gods that don't even exist in the first place. Their whole religion is a sham. And the king has kind of figured it out. And he said, you know, I think these guys, they just make stuff up. Bingo! And so the king wants to know what the real religion is, what the true, who the true God is, so he can get the truth about what the dream means because he knows that the real God gave him the dream. And he needs to know what it means. Verse 10, The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. They are begging for their lives because the king's about to put them to death and they can't tell him what the dream was. And they, they can't just make it up. They have no idea what to say. They're in a tough spot. Verse 12, because of this, the king was angry and very furious. And he commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. The king says, that's it, kill all my advisors. They can't tell me what the dream means, just execute every one of them. Daniel and his three friends were in training to become advisors to the king. But they haven't been even included in this story. I mean, they're still in, in, in school to become wise men. They haven't even graduated. So the king didn't think, and the other wise men didn't think, to ask Daniel and his friends for help because, well, they were smarter than these Hebrew boys. And Daniel is, what, 13, 14 years old, maybe 15? I mean, he's a kid. He can't help. These guys have been doing this for decades. They're the experts. So they didn't even bother asking for Daniel and his friends' help. And the king decreed that all the wise men, which would include those who were being in training, that they all be killed. Verse 13, so the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel, not for his help, but to kill him. They sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Verse 14, Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? I mean, they show up, at Daniel's house one day, knock on the door and say, Daniel, come out here. It's time for us to kill you. And we're killing all the wise men. Why? The king said so. And Daniel says, well, hold on, why? Why does he want to kill all the wise men? Well, I didn't do anything. I, I've been learning Aramaic, okay? I've been, I've been studying books all day. What, what is this about? Can, can we talk about this for a minute? And so Daniel, he doesn't know what's going on until they show up to kill him. Verse 15, and he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so urgent? And Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. Arioch says, well, the king had a dream. 
king wants to know what the dream is and what it means, and nobody can tell him. Verse 16, And Daniel went in, and he requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. This is a bold move. Daniel goes before the king and says, King, if you'll give me a few minutes of your time, just pencil it in on your schedule, I'll tell you what the dream means. Now, at this point, Daniel doesn't know yet. But he knows who knows. And he knows that his God will tell him because God didn't bring him a thousand miles to Babylon for no reason. Now, I want to... I want you to hear something before we move on. The book of Daniel is not about Daniel. The book of Daniel is about the God of Daniel, and namely his son, Jesus Christ. I'm sure that Daniel wanted to go home. He didn't want to be a slave anymore. He didn't want to be in exile in Jerusalem. But God was doing something. And Daniel was in great discomfort and pain. But hear me, God's purposes do not always mean that He intends to make our lives easier. He wants to make us useful to Him. He wants us to bring Him glory and honor. And if God had not taken Daniel from Jerusalem to Babylon as a slave, because remember in chapter 1, we were told God had this happen. It was God who delivered Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and had Daniel carried away as a slave. God is the one who ultimately orchestrated all this. He is sovereign over what is happening in Daniel's life, and God's purpose is not to make Daniel's life easier. God's purpose is to use Daniel to bring him glory. And as long as we have people who call themselves Christians who think that the Christian faith teaches that God's ultimate purpose is to make your life easier, then we're not going to understand things like this in the Bible. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about Daniel. It's about Jesus. And sometimes, many times, God has His people go through painful trials in order to glorify Himself and ultimately to point us to Jesus Christ. And I know that may sound harsh and hard for you to receive, but number one, it's what the Word of God says, so it's true. And number two, we don't understand what God is doing in time and history. And God has an ultimate eternal purpose. And one day, when we reach eternity, when we reach heaven's shore, we will understand it, but not before then. And notice, Daniel never questions God. He doesn't say, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? In fact, Daniel says, I know this is why my God brought me here, and if you'd give me a few minutes of your time, king, I'll tell you what the dream means, because this must be the reason God has me here. So if you're going through pain and toil and struggle in your life, know this, God has appointed this time in your life. He is doing something. And it may be hard and it may be painful. But do you want your life to count for something? Do you want to serve Jesus well? Or do you just want to try to live your days out on this earth in as much comfort as possible? I know it's tempting to just say, I I just want the easy life. But brothers and sisters, may we be like Daniel and say, I want the meaningful life. I want to point to Jesus. I want to serve Him. Verse 17. Daniel, remember, he doesn't know yet what the dream was. But he's going to find out. And he knows what to do. It's time for a prayer meeting. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to to his house and made the matter known to Hananel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his three friends. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. They're not so wise. They don't know. So they pray all night, and they ask God, God, please reveal this to us, because if you don't, we're going to die. And we figure this must be why you brought us here. Verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. 
And Daniel answered and said, Now before we hear what the dream was, listen to how Daniel responds in a psalm of prayer to his God. Because Daniel understands this is why God's brought me here. He's not just happy that God has saved his life. Daniel is happy that God's going to be glorified. Listen. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. Verse 21, He changes times and seasons. In other words, the reason I'm here and not back home in Jerusalem is because God brought me here. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. I know that this is not a coincidence. I know that Jehoiakim was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar and I was brought here because God removes kings and sets up kings. He, God, gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with Him. I love verse 22. This world is in darkness and the light dwells with God. Only He can give us light and truth. Verse 23. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and you have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Praise God. This all has a meaning. And God is doing something. And Daniel doesn't complain about the plight in his life. He praises his God that he had the opportunity to be brought to Babylon in order to glorify his God. Verse 24, Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and he went in and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Daniel sounds pretty confident, doesn't he? Verse 25, And then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. Now notice, Arioch doesn't say he'll tell you the dream. I think Arioch's not trying to overpromise here. He can tell you what the dream means. But remember, the king wants to know what the dream was and then what it means. But Daniel can do both. Arioch's not as confident, but Daniel is. Verse 26, and the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? So once again, Nebuchadnezzar says, I don't just want to know what it means. First you tell me what I saw in my dream. Then tell me what it means. Can you do that? Verse 27, Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. No man can do this. No, No mere man can reveal this to you. Verse 28, but there is a God in heaven. Amen. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So before Daniel tells him what the dream was, he just says, I want you to know that the dream that you had is what's about to happen in the latter days. Now I could take you on an excursus through biblical history and how this phrase, the latter days, is used in the Old Testament. But let me just sum it up and we'll look at this later in our study of Daniel as time allows. The latter days refers to the very end of human history, what's going to happen in the so-called end times. And he's saying that God has revealed to you, Nebuchadnezzar, what's going to happen from today until the end of history. God has revealed to you a a, a vision of what the rest of human and world history has in store. He has revealed to you what will happen from now until the end times. And so he says, He's made known to you What will happen in the latter days, your dream and your visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. Verse 29, now he tells him what he saw. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what would be. Notice the king lays awake at night wondering what's going to happen. 
Nebuchadnezzar was afraid he was going to lose his kingdom. Kings went to war with one another all the time and defeated each other. Nebuchadnezzar was a constantly worried and paranoid man. And so he was up one night worrying, and God said, I'm going to show you what's going to happen, Nebuchadnezzar. He has made known to you what is to be. Now, I just want to say something here. Not what might happen, not what could happen, what will happen. And Nebuchadnezzar has no ability to change the future. I entitled the sermon today, The History of the Future. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 46.10 that God has declared the end from before the beginning. From ancient times, things not yet even come to pass. God has written down the future in his book. And it is just as certain as the past. And Nebuchadnezzar cannot change it. Verse 30. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Notice, this isn't about me, Daniel says. I want you to be impressed with me, king. This is about God. And he wants you to know who's in charge. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, or statue, mighty and of exceeding brightness stood before you. And its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold. Its chest and its arms of silver. Its middle and thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and all the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36, now this was the dream. And now we will tell the king its interpretation. So the dream is, there's a statue, it's huge, it's got four parts. The head is gold, then further down it's silver, then it's bronze, then it's iron and clay. Now this is going to be further explained in the book of Daniel. And what we're going to find out is that the four parts of this statue represent four kingdoms. Three of them are named in the book of Daniel. The first king is Babylon. The second king is Medo-Persia, which are two kingdoms that united together into one. And then the third kingdom is Greece. And then it's not named in Daniel because it wouldn't exist for hundreds of years later, but the details given clearly show that the fourth kingdom was the kingdom of Rome, the Roman Empire. And so there are four kingdoms that are going to come in human history. And the current one is Babylon, but then also... Babylon will be conquered by Medo-Persia, which will then be conquered by Greece, which will then be conquered by Rome. But notice what Daniel is saying here. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I know you're laying awake at night worrying about whether or not uh, you're going to be destroyed. Let me just let you know, you are. <laughs> okay? There's another kingdom coming, and it's going to crush you. And there's another kingdom coming after that one, and it's going to crush that one. And there's another kingdom coming after that one, and it's going to crush that one. But then there is a stone that is going to come down out of heaven from God, not cut by any human hand, and it's going to crush and destroy every human kingdom. And this reminds me of Psalm chapter 118, verse 22 to 25, which we sang this morning, which begins by saying, Behold, the stone that the builders rejected. He has become the chief cornerstone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What day is that about? The day that the cornerstone was rejected and became the chief cornerstone. The day that this rock was rejected by men and set on His throne by God in heaven when Jesus died for our sins and rose from the grave and conquered sin and death. This day, the day that Jesus died and then rose again, this is the day the Lord has made. He wrote it down before human history began. It was a part of His plan all along. That's what it means that He made this day. He planned this rock to crush every human kingdom. 
And Daniel picks up on the language of Psalm 118, 22 to 25, and he quotes it here in the dream. Verse 37. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. You're that first kingdom on that statue. And another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. You're going to be destroyed by another kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. And there's nothing you can do about it. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Verse 40, And there there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mix with the soft clay. Now we don't have time to get into it now, But the fourth kingdom is going to be split into two, represented by two legs. That happened in the division of the east and the west in the Roman Empire. And then that's going to be divided into ten toes. Those are all the sub-kingdoms that came out of Rome after it fell. It's incredible that the prophecy here goes forth hundreds of years into human history. And we can look back and we will as we move forward in the book of Daniel about how all this happened exactly as the dream and the prophecy have said. Verse 44, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and that broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God, the real God, has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. You and every other human kingdom are going to be destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, when we come back next time in chapter 3, you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar build a huge statue of gold. And it's gold from head to toe. You want to know why? Because Nebuchadnezzar was saying, I'm going to be the only kingdom and nobody's going to take me out. Well, guess what? It didn't work. It's one of the reasons why you need to read books from beginning to end is because you don't understand chapter 3 unless you understand chapter 2. We'll get there later. But Nebuchadnezzar is going to try to fight against this. It's not going to work. Now let's look at the end of chapter 2. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, and he paid homage to Daniel. And he commanded that an offering, an incense, be offered up to him. And the king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Now, Nebuchadnezzar ain't saved. But he knows that Daniel's God is real. Because Daniel knew the dream and what it meant. And nobody else could tell him. But don't mistake this for Nebuchadnezzar being a godly man. He's not, and chapters 3 and 4 are going to prove it. Verse 48, Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and over the chief prefect of all the wise men of Babylon. This sounds so much like Genesis chapter 41, it's unbelievable. You know the story of Joseph in Egypt? And he tells the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the dreams that he had and what they meant. And then he's promoted to second in command. Same thing happens hundreds of years later to Daniel here. It's almost like God had planned this out. Because he did. Verse 49. Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Daniel becomes the chief wise man. One more thing that you need to know about Daniel and the wise men. When this was translated into Greek, because eventually the Old Testament was translated into Greek about 200 years before Jesus was born, it was called the Septuagint. When this was translated into Greek, the word magi, wise men in Greek, was translated magoi in Hebrew, magi. When the magi show up in Jesus' day in Matthew chapter 2, 
they are the people who had been trained, at least their ancestors, their predecessors had, by the prophet Daniel. And when they came seeking a star, which would show them where the Messiah would be born, they knew what to look for because Daniel told them what to look for. Just a little tidbit of information. So you really don't understand Matthew chapter 2 and the story of the Magi unless you understand Daniel chapter 2 and the story of how Daniel came to train all the Magi. They put him in school to teach him their wisdom and within a year the tables were turned in reverse and Daniel brought them to school and taught them his wisdom and it carried on for 500 years until when Jesus was born in Matthew chapter 2. You tell me God doesn't do amazing things. Brothers and sisters... God is on his throne in heaven. He is sovereign over the kings and the kingdoms of this earth. He will accomplish his purposes. And yes, sometimes that means pain and trouble in our life. But praise God, he has a plan and a purpose. And he will be glorified. And we get to be a part of it and to be used by him for his kingdom and his glory. And I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. I'm with Daniel. Praise God. Though this world is in darkness... In him alone there is light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And God, as we continue in Daniel in the coming months, Lord, would you just bless our study? Give us a thirst, a desire, a a hunger for the word of God and what it says. And may we, like Daniel, be willing to set aside our own lives to serve you. May we not question your purposes, but may we trust you and know that you are good And you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your eternal purpose.